This is the current federal tax developments for the week of September the 27th, 2021. Current federal tax developments are brought to you by Kaplan Financial Education and your State Society of CPAs. This week we're going to look at a couple of court cases and take a very short run through what's happening currently in D.C., which primarily is not a whole lot. So in the cases this week, we're going to talk about one case where a taxpayer just had a bunch of different issues. And it gives us a chance to talk about some of the issues taxpayers run into with auto expenses for a trader business. Uh, a unique kind of odd problem this taxpayer had for reasons that kind of become clear uh, due to retirement plan contributions. And then uh, also something that I think a lot of our clients might have trouble understanding that deals with the proper way of handling demolition expenses. And also an issue with the year in which one can claim a deduction for something like a casualty loss. We also have, for the first time in quite a while, I realize I hadn't talked about it in a state tax case in quite a while, that largely had been because since we got to an exemption of over $5 million per you know individual, so about $10 million for a couple that we ended up doing, and then we increased that and doubled down on it again in the TCJA, uh, it had become less interesting, shall we, said, shall we say, to a lot of those of you who listen to this, because fewer and fewer of your client base were being subjected to a potential estate tax. But we did have an interesting case this week that looked through some issues that are important, especially for clients who do have a potentially taxable estate. And since we may be looking at a reducing that back down to the one half of the current level uh, for doing this, so somewhere around probably $6 million in the estate as part of a potential tax law change, it might be useful to brush up again on how clients can foul up an estate plan, because this was one of those cases where the client had an idea that was an idea that could have worked, but the client managed to figure out how to make it not work. Now, let's start by talking about what's going on in D.C. as of the time I'm recording this. I'm recording this on Sunday, September 26th. Officially, per the original promise, when they got the votes in the Senate to pass the bipartisan infrastructure bill, we were supposed to have a vote on the bipartisan infrastructure bill by the 27th of September. Now, there's still one day left when I record this, but given the processes that take place in the House and the fact that you're probably not going to get any Republican members to consent, or at least very limited, uh, and you may not get some Democrats to either because this bill's become, it's got issues, and we'll talk about that in just a second. But because of that, it's highly likely that at the earliest a vote would take place on Wednesday, that'd be Wednesday the 29th, and it's very possible no vote will take place this week at all. What's the hang-up? The hang-up is a $3.5 trillion package that's part of the reconciliation bill. And what's happening currently is that is somewhat, well, if you believe the president, it's stalled in, the, in their negotiations to get an agreement. If you believe the announcements of the Democratic leadership early on Friday, uh, they, they now have some sort of menu agreement. But we found out over time that that really wasn't agreeing to a whole lot, except we already knew about that those things are already listed are kind of where we're going to be taking these things from. And the key becomes more how much it's going to be and how you're going to get that through. So what's happening right now is that the progressives in the Democratic, in the House, have basically stated that if they don't get the $3.5 trillion bill to go through and they can't get a deal on that, they're not going to vote for the infrastructure bill, the bipartisan infrastructure bill, there are a few Republicans that have stayed in the House. They will vote for it, but nowhere near enough it would appear to overcome the shortfall if all other Republicans and the progressives vote against it. So we have an interesting situation. But as far as proposals go, haven't been a whole lot of changes in what's been proposed. We still have the laundry list, both from the House that has cleared ways and means. And then the Senate's had a lot of ideas, including revising partnership 
uh, rules to a large degree, uh, maybe a wealth tax, a few other things. But right now, everything is kind of on hold. We're nowhere near passing anything. So I just mentioned this not because I have anything to tell you, but more because you just need to keep your eyes. One thing that happens in Congress, there's probably about an equal chance this simply crashes, burns, and we don't get anything out of Congress. Or suddenly, in no time flat, we go from no agreement to full agreement to enacted law. That's kind of how we saw this play out uh, four years ago, uh, and actually in two in the Congress that was elected in 2016. We saw the crash and burn scenario with repeal and replace, and we saw the suddenly everything came together scenario with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. It's not really clear which one of those scenarios we're going to get this time, uh, but there's a real good chance we get one or the other uh, at the end of the day. It seems unlikely, though I guess possible, but unlikely that we would get the infrastructure bill without getting the $3.5 trillion package together, at least unless a lot of Republicans came on board in the House and they didn't change the bill at all. So it could go straight to the president and then we'd see if the president would sign it or if the president would hold out for the $3.5 trillion package. And again, who knows? So just keep your eyes on D.C., but there's not really anything actionable right now. There's a lot to be aware of, a lot to discuss with clients right now, but not a lot to do something about yet. Yes, I know some people are saying, go, 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 do now. And if you got the future right, if your crystal ball is perfect, then some of the do now things sure would make sense. But my crystal ball has never been quite that perfect and so I really get worried about doing things that the client would otherwise have no inclination to do in a way that absolutely cannot be unwound if the future does not come out the way is expected. So I understand the push. I understand why people get into this. I would just tell, you know, tell the clients that fundamentally, uh, you know, Congress go either way and it could be radically different and you could make some majorly bad decisions. Uh, if you jump too quickly, assuming you know how the future is going to go, and then the future doesn't go that way. So just, you know, kind of be there. If there's something they could do that might help with the new law, and they were going to do it anyway, and it might be a key issue to get it done before the law, yeah, those are things you do. But you don't do something that the client would simply say no way at all to doing, let's say, two, three years ago, they said, no way I'd ever do that. You don't just do it today because you think it might help you with some other situation. Yeah, if you're right, it's great. If you're wrong, that's a real nightmare. So be aware of that. Okay, with that, let's go ahead and let's go to our first case of the week. Uh, this is the case of Parker v. Commissioner. This is Task Court Memorandum Decision 2021-111. It came down on the 23rd of September. And this case was interesting primarily because the taxpayers, and this is the type of case we often see with taxpayers who go to court. Um, you know, they're in tax court and they're fighting over a bunch of issues. The one thing I know almost immediately if I see a tax court case and there are like four or five totally independent, distinct issues, right, that have nothing to do with each other that most likely the taxpayer is going to lose on documentation because that's the most likely reason why we have five different issues that appear totally disconnected from each other. And in this case, at least for two of these we're going to talk about here, it really is documentation problems that kill them. In the third case, it's, yeah, they just kind of have a total misunderstanding of the law and we have to deal with that. Although, Honestly, the last one we're going to talk about is one I think to a lot of even tax pros who maybe haven't been around the issue might think this all works fine, just Congress shut it down a few years ago. So in the case of Parker of Commissioner, they were looking at their taxpayer's tax return for 2015, and they had a few issues. The first one I want to talk to you about is the issue they had with car and truck expense. And Car and truck expense falls under a special rule. And we've mentioned this before. The most cited case we see in the tax court 
is the 1930 case of Cohen versus Commissioner, that is entertainer George M. Cohen, entertainer producer George M. Cohen. Citation 39 F. 2nd 540 is our reference to the Cohen case, and it led to what we know of as the Cohen rule. And what was argued in Cohen was that George had no documentation for his expenses. But if you think of today, probably one of the closest similarities to George would be somebody like Steven Spielberg, you know, who now produces movies. But we would assume that Mr. Spielberg incurs a number of expenses related to his movie production work each year in his company, right? In the various companies and organizations he operates through the controls. It's reasonable, you know, Mr. Spielberg is going to incur expenses. That's pretty clear. So it's pretty clear that George was incurring expenses, but he didn't have records. The Board of Tax Appeals, which was the predecessor to the tax court, agreed with the IRS that, you know, no records, no deduction. And a lot of people, you know, think that way. But the Cohen case opened up an exception saying, no, we don't agree with that. Come on, it's George M. Cohen, right? In essence, you know, the, the judge is kind of like, look, we know there's a legitimate business. We've seen the shows, right? There is a business. We know it exists. We know it has to have some expenses. Now, it's not good that George didn't give us any documentation, but they're saying essentially that, okay, you can approximate the amount of expenses as long as it's clear, you know, that some expenses have to have been incurred. Uh, they did say you can, the quote that was in the opinion, bearing heavily if the court so chooses upon the taxpayer whose inexactitude is of his own making. So essentially, I can penalize the taxpayer for not having the records and assume down toward the low end, you know, low end of what would be possible. And the allowance must be, you know, some factual basis. We must have a reasonable basis for determining how much of an expense to allow. We can't just pick numbers out of thin air. But generally, the law says as long as you have an expense, it is clear an expense would have been incurred. Like, for instance, in this case, it is clear that the taxpayer would have had to travel to do the work they were doing from their main business location to various points around. And if there's a way to reasonably estimate, even though we don't have the exact information, then we could do so. But there's a catch. Congress was not thrilled with the Cohen decision. And so in the code we have at Section 274D, a substantiation requirements. And no credit or deduction shall be allowed per 274D uh, with respect to any listed property defined in 280FD4, which is where the car is going to come in, unless the taxpayer substantiates by adequate records or sufficient evidence corroborating the taxpayer's own statement, the amount of the expense, the time and place of the expense, the business purpose of the item, and the business relationship in here. And the IRS can issue regulations on this point. Car is listed property under the rules found at 280F and being listed property, the commissioner has put out regulations that says we need some contemporaneous documentation of the expenses in question to get a deduction under 274D. Now, in this case, the taxpayer basically claimed a deduction of essentially car and truck expenses of $28,870 uh, and they also claimed about, you know, 4083 of depreciation. Now, the problem we have in this case for them is they didn't keep a log. Okay, that's not absolutely required, but it's really, really helpful. So they didn't have any of these and didn't have access to reliable odometer readings from the period. The IRS also, generally what they want you to have is a log showing every business trip and proof of the from the odometer of the mileage on the odometer to start the year, the mileage on the odometer at the end of the year. And the theory is if I know my business miles, I know my total mileage from the odometer, then I can take my business miles divided by total mileage and I can use that as a percentage 
to then calculate my auto expenses overall. And that's what they were doing. Now, during the exam, as often happens here, examining agent shows up. They just had a number that they came up with. So now on exam, they try to estimate. This tends to go badly. It did in this case, right? What they tried to do is they tried to use, because this is Ms. Parker's um, information, you know, her Schedule C, uh, they tried to use her calendar, right? Uh, her driving habits in general, and some distances that were taken from Google Maps. So, and then they took out what they estimated their commuting miles were from the calculus, and they assumed no other personal miles except for weekly trips to buy groceries and bi-weekly trips to buy household items and monthly trips to Costco. Uh, you know, they ended up with a business percentage of 97%. And that was kind of a problem. The catch is, though, you know, the tax court said, sorry, guys, we, we, we can't buy your system, right? You had no contemporaneous records of the mileage driven. Uh, you haven't accounted for the spouse's personal use of the car. The court came down and said, we don't find it plausible that the only personal miles you ever drove on the car were these specific shopping trips that were done on this regular basis. You know, we, we, ha we suspect there were other personal trips one might make besides these very, very structured, scheduled shopping trips. So we have a little problem with that issue. And third, the evidence that was provided was inconsistent with other evidence they presented. So this also often happens when clients are trying to reconstruct things, they will end up creating evidence. You know, you can find evidence of things that just don't tie in with what they've stated. And yes, there were a number of inconsistencies in the record for her stuff. So because of this, they essentially lost all the business mileage except for the minor parts that the IRS allowed. What I found somewhat interesting was the IRS actually allowed the full depreciation they'd claimed, which I find generous, actually, given the facts. But again, the court wasn't go, going to go back and undo that because the IRS has conceded the depreciation. So it wasn't the court's issue to decide. I would suspect that in most cases, the agent's not going to concede the depreciation. And you're probably going to have a bit of a problem on your hands with that. Now, the next problem was somewhat unique. I understand why the court had a problem with it and why the IRS did, but it's not something I've normally seen. The taxpayers claimed a deduction for a solo 401k for Ms. Parker's uh, business, right? And what they did on April 14th of the following year, they deposited $140,000 into her retirement account, right? Um, you know, and the problem was that of this, right, they, and we, we could see the money come into the account in essentially two blocks, 100267 that came in on a cashier's check and 26793 labeled funds received and 12940 also labeled funds received. Now, the 26793 was a rollover. Uh, from her retirement account with British Telecom. Okay, that's good. And the 12,940 funds received was a rollover from Mr. Parker's retirement account with CTS. And the remaining $100,000 consisted of what they said was 39,823 rolled over from an earlier solo 401k account plus 60,444 of unexplained funds. Now, they were claiming a deduction for 60444 The problem here and what I think caught and what I clearly caused a big issue was the fact that they had all this money rolling into the account at one time. And it kept coming from retirement accounts and they had other retirement accounts that had been involved in over the years. So the problem with the IRS was they, they wanted to prove where the 6444 come from. We wanted the source of those funds to double check that it had not come from another retirement account or some other source that would not allow for the deduction. Well, the court actually went along with this because, in essence, what they said was, you know, 
They they contend, of course, that this was rolled over. Talk about the earlier four hundred one k and major six forty four is deductible contribution. Uh, they had no evidence of where that sixty thousand four forty four originated, whether it was a new cash or was a rollover from a pre existing plan. They failed to produce any bank or brokerage records showing the source of funds. And after the trial was over, they asserted in their post trial brief that oh well, we we prefer to keep our savings at home. And this is probably not a good thing to say next, but it is what they said. Where they are protected, okay, and safe from unscrupulous individuals, including IRS agents. Okay, hint. When you're going to tax court, probably this is not a good place to take digs at the IRS agents and talk about hiding funds. You know, that's fine if you're, you know, going to be talking with, with your buddies and all those things. But in tax court, to talk about hiding funds and calling IRS agents unscrupulous is probably going to help convince the court that you might be trying to pull a fast one here. OK, you, you seem to have justified in your own mind that it's OK to try to hide things from the IRS. Don't say that. Hate to say it, just not a good thing to say. Suffice it to say, I've never had the IRS challenge in this manner, you know, a contribution to retirement account by wanting to see the source of the funds and then going down that. They usually want to see the money go in. I can't recall them ever asking me where the money came from. Uh, but in this case, with all the other stuff going in, I'm sure the problem was they saw $140,000 going into that account. Uh, and they were saying sixty four forty four. What's all this other stuff? And that's where we got into the multiple rollovers from at least three sources. And they began to get worried about, well, did the other money come from more sources like this? And the problem was the taxpayer ended up with the deduction totally disallowed. So again, unique, and I think the taxpayers shot themselves in the foot here on their own, uh, might have gone better for them without that post-trial brief uh, and at least not, not taking the dig at IRS agents and hiding funds. Those were both kind of probably not the best things to say. I'm just going to say it that way. Finally, we want to talk about demolition expenses. Now, this is an interesting issue, and a lot of people probably don't know this, this exists. So the catch was he tried to claim, um, you know, what was $10,000 in repairs expense that related to cost to demolish a property he had bought seven years earlier, right, that he thought he was going to live in. Then they thought they were going to rent, but could never rent. Finally, they kept holding this, this thing and they, they, you know, they, they let the insurance lapse. Vandals came in and burned the place. So the place burns down in 2014. And then finally in 2015, I would suspect that, you know, neighbors and zoning people and, you know, cities, etc., don't really like burned out houses sitting there without something happening. So they came in in 2015 and demolished the building, you know, paying $10,000. Now, you know, before the tax court, you know, the taxpayer at, you know, the IRS disallowed entirely. The taxpayers at least figured this out for going to tax court. They didn't have a rental. They weren't trying to rent it. So at court, they agreed, yep, it, it shouldn't have been on Schedule E, right? That, 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 that was not the good place. It should have been a Schedule A miscellaneous itemized deductions as a casualty loss or as an expense related to income producing property. Property held for the production of income. And they said, and because of that, they want to deduct a larger amount, which meant the demolition expenses plus a permit to allow for the demolition to take place and, uh, you know, write off their basis in the building due to the casualty loss. They claimed that they should be able to get all three of those. Now, first problem they run into. Back in 1984, the, the Congress adopted IRC Section 280 Cap B, and this was meant to disallow a deduction for most demolition expenses 
force them to go back into basis. If you demolish something, it's going to go into basis normally of the land. So it says basically that that law tells you in the case of a demolition of any structure, no deduction otherwise allowable under this chapter shall be allowed to the owner or lessee of such structures for any amount expended for such demolition or any loss exchanged on account of such demolition. And they shall be treated as properly chargeable to capital account with regard to the land on which the demolished property was located. So essentially it runs into land. Now, the taxpayer gets good, says, wait, regulation 1.165-3 talks about being able to deduct demolition expenses. Now, that regulation was came in and it was actually first written in the 1960s, last updated in 1973. The tax court points out, and this is something to be very used to in reading regs. The IRS is not necessarily really good about cleaning up regs or updating them when the law changes. But remember, the law overrides a reg. The Internal Revenue Code specifically bars this deduction. It does not matter that a regulation that predated that law allows for the deduction this law repeals that, and presumably Congress is presumed to have knowledge of these positions in the regs. So we always, you know, go with the idea that yeah, they're 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 basically repealing all that. The law always overrides the regs, and as I said, you need to check the date of regs and check your law. You know, and when the law has been changed after the reg came out, and in this case, obviously. You know, this is a fairly major problem, but it's still sitting there. Uh, you, you can't do the reg. So the court says, yep, clearly the reg doesn't matter. Now, they did have another theory. They, they claimed they showed, as a, they showed as a casualty loss. Well, court had a couple of problems with that. First, they said the problem was the casualty took place in 2014. You can't deduct a casualty loss in 2015 for the loss in 14, we are an annual tax system. You got to claim the deduction in the right year, right? You don't get to move something unless there's a provision in the law that allows it to be moved. And secondly, the notice points out does not allow a deduction for demolition expenses. The notice in question said, notice 9021, which is what they referred to to say, well, that notice allowed this deduction. It talks about a casualty and later demolition of the property, but it specifically notes you can't that you can only deduct the casualty, that is the basis of the building itself. The demolition costs do not get added to that. Rather, demolition costs in that situation have to be added back to the basis of the property, the land in this question. So in essence, they weren't allowed to deduct this. They couldn't add that back to their basis. So yeah, we're just kind of stuck with that system. That's what we're at. So again, interesting kind of three different topics that people run into. The case proposed them. Didn't really break any new ground on any of the three. But it was interesting, just, just to remind you what those, how those things work. The next one is the estate of Connolly versus United States. This is United States District Court for the Eastern District of the State of Missouri. Uh, case number 4, colon 19, C-01410. The decision came down on September the 21st. So let's talk about the Connolly case. Now, this was a close, a closely held family business, right? A corporation. It sold roofing and supply materials. Now, Michael, uh, who was the older brother, owned a majority interest in the company. His brother, Thomas, owned the remainder of the company. Now, they had entered into a buy-sell agreement, which a lot of small companies do right at that point. And at the time they entered into it, it was, you know, neither one was in bad health. There was no obvious way they knew who was going to die first. So, you know, looks okay from that standpoint. But they did the buy-sell, right? So we're talking about this additional issue. Now, 
The stock purchase agreement said first, the shares of Michael, when he died, the estate had to offer those shares. His brother had a right to buy back, the, to buy the shares from his, from his brother's estate. Thomas did not do this. The law, the buy-sell then went on and said that, well, if, if Thomas didn't exercise the option, then the company had to buy back the shares. And, you know, and the company is either going to buy back the shares uh, based on a couple of pricing mechanisms. And the first one is that they were to, as you often see here, they were to set an agreed upon price every year and update that. So they were to update an agreement every year for an agreed upon price. If they had not done so, the agreement provided that there were to be a, a you know, at the death, there would be appraisers brought in at least two. And the appraisers would come up with a fair market value, which would then be used for the company to redeem Michael. But at Michael's death, we did neither of those. First thing is the brothers had never set the agreed price. So it never took place, never was set. So we're kind of stuck with that. Okay. Now, the company had a life insurance policy of $3.5 million on Michael's life. So what Michael and the estate agreed to, or what I should say, Thomas and the estate, Thomas was the executor agreed to, was to go ahead and sell him the company or sell, you know, redeem the shares for essentially, in this case, $3 million in cash. Um, you know, uh, the son of Michael secured a three years option to purchase the company from Thomas for $4,166,666, which interestingly enough is more than what we paid to redeem Michael. But okay, if the value went up, he could do it for that. But then even better, number three, in the event that Thomas sold the company within 10 years, Thomas and Michael agreed to split evenly the proceeds from any future sale. Now, the IRS said, okay, guys, we got a couple of problems with this. First thing is, you know, because they're saying, we got a buy-sell agreement. That sets the, you know, so our values protected. And the IRS said, no, it's not. They, they said, you know, we, we, we don't think it meets the requirement to be accepted. We'll talk about that here in just a second. And you didn't follow it anyway. And then the IRS also said the proper value for the company should have included the $3.5 million of life insurance proceeds. Now, the estate claimed that, in fact, yes, yes, I know, when Michael died, we got $3.5 million, but we had an offsetting, at least mostly offsetting, obligation to buy the shares from Michael, so that should be a net zero. Now, this was in line with the decision the 11th Circuit had come down with a few years ago. So they, they said, yeah, that, that's not it. So, hey, we don't care. You know, the value of the company is three point whatever million is whatever they set it at. And the IRS, you know, tough guys, you know, we're, we're just not, you know, the, actually, the life insurance doesn't count toward the value of the company. Now, if that life insurance counted with the IRS's expert, the rule was that, you know, the additional estate tax would be about a million dollars they owed. So the estate paid the million dollars and then sued to get this in the U.S. District Court. So we went, went down that, that path. Now, for a buy-sell agreement, generally Section 2703A provides that we don't pay attention to such agreements generally. But like any good provision, it then goes go with a however clause, which means forget that. The agreement will be accepted and will control the value if three things are true. This is under 2703B. The arrangement is a bona fide business arrangement. The arrangement is not a device to transfer such property to members of the decedent's family for less than full and adequate consideration in money or money's worth. And the agreement's terms are comparable to similar arrangements entered into 
by persons in an arm's length transaction. Right. So now the court indicated right away that this may not be relevant in this case. A practical reason was they didn't really follow the buy-sell agreement. So you know, it's one of those things where, yeah, it's probably not. And, you know, we got all these other issues and really the life insurance is what we're going to fight over. But the court said, but we will go ahead and take a look at the buy-sell because we're going to find that wouldn't have worked anyway, even if they, you know, it wouldn't have worked anyway if you were just arguing that. And so they looked. Now, the IRS claimed it failed on all of the three tests. But the court told, said the IRS, well, you actually are wrong about the first test. The reason they entered into this agreement was because they wanted to keep the company in the family. And the court said that is a valid, bona fide reason to enter into a buy-sell. We have a ton of case law where that has been allowed, right? We don't really have a problem with that concept of doing it. Now, the IRS said, okay, we understand this, um, but, you know, they didn't really follow it, so that, that meant it wasn't bona fide. And the court said, okay, look, IRS, we don't really care about this because they're going to lose on other things anyway. But they said, this is a motion for summary judgment. We would need to have much more information about them not following this and apparently doing something different to say this wasn't a bona fide business agreement. We find that there's adequate business purpose. So on that issue alone, we would not dismiss the agreement by saying it didn't have a bona fide business purpose. But the court then says immediately, and it's really irrelevant, uh, even though, you know, we said we might take that at trial, we might consider that option, but it's irrelevant because the estate loses the other two. And the real issue here is, was this a device to transfer property to a family member, his brother, at less than full and adequate consideration? Now, one thing to note is this does make it much tougher to get a buy-sell through as valid. It raises an additional hurdle for a company where you have related shareholders, so traditional family business, as opposed to a company with multiple unrelated shareholders. And let's be honest, in a practical matter, absent some other facts, the IRS will tend to accept, you know, where you have totally independent shareholders, they'll accept their buy-sell, right? Because the idea is not no party would pay more than they have to and no party would agree to receive less than they should because these are totally unrelated people. There's no obvious reason why we would transfer uh, to them for, you know, in order to transfer wealth at no cost to that person. Now, they might look at things like, is this this guy's compensation and some other issues that we might get into? But generally, you're still going to be safer here. And here they had a problem. And when you get right down to it, the biggest problem was that what happened, and this is where the life insurance comes into play, let's think about this. This was actually a way to get Thomas 100% of the company as it existed on the day Michael died with all assets it had, the instant before Michael died, at no cost to Thomas. That was a transfer to Thomas essentially for no consideration. We were transferring him the business and we weren't counting that as a transfer for estate tax purposes. The court found that, well, that's, you know, no, it's very clear. He ends up with everything in the business at no cost to himself. I mean, had he redeemed the, poly had he redeemed the stock himself, and had he, let's say, even done that with a life insurance policy that he had maintained on his brother, yes, we're fine. There was an economic cost there. He would have paid the economic cost to get the policy, would have paid to fund it over the years, would have paid for the shares. But in this case, essentially, he was able to get 100% ownership of everything that was there the day before Michael died without himself having to give anything up. And that was a problem, 
right? They, they didn't see how this worked, right? And they said the other problem we have was that the arrangement also specifically excluded the use of any sort of you know, extra amount, you know, control premium on shares because Michael had a majority of the company. We all know from standard rules we use in valuation that you recognize minority discounts and control premiums. We use those all the time for estate planning. They don't just conveniently disappear when they're inconvenient to the taxpayer. So in this case, the valuation took not into account at all the fact that Thomas was getting a, you know, essentially a control premium part of the company. We didn't value that and pay out Michael more because he had a control premium. And we didn't recognize any discount in value. All shares were the same. And that was also said, well, that also doesn't look like it looks like we're trying to transfer things essentially to achieve a transfer of the company to the surviving brother at no cost to the brother and without paying any transfer tax there. They're saying, no, wait, the whole point of the estate tax is to pay taxes on transfers of assets. And what you're doing here is you're getting a transfer of asset with nothing else happening. They said, so it appears to be this kind of structure that was merely set up as device to transfer the property to the brother tax-free. And then finally, they took a look at, was it similar, similar arms length agreement, comparable similar arms length agreement? Now, the court spends most of the time discussing the fact that the life insurance should have been included in the valuation. A actual third-party buyer would never have agreed to buy all the shares of the company uh, and, you know, buy all the shares of the company or sell all the shares. Nobody would have sold it, you know, along with that life insurance without, you know, charging them. The, the buyer would not expect a discount for the three million of life insurance they're going to get there when Michael dies, um, that would then be used to redeem their own shares. And that was kind of one of their big complaints about this. Now, you know, there are also a couple of other issues they had. Did did this agreement provide for a fixed and determinable price? And, you know, the opinion agreed with the IRS that said essentially, since they never set the value. And they didn't actually use this. You know, we really can't say that it worked. You know, it wasn't really what they did. And also as important was to be covered, this has to be an agreement that was treated as binding during life and at death. And while the court said, you know, we can't say it wasn't treated as binding during life. The IRS claimed that would be true because they never set a value. The court said, but there was a mechanism that would have allowed a value to be set. So since they never used that during life as part of the buy-sell, we can't say, though, they didn't respect it. But what we can say is it was very obvious at death that the estate, you know, and the minority interest holder totally ignored it. So they said, so obviously they didn't consider this to be binding at death. Finally, on the fair market value, uh, this is one where the court breaks from a decision in the 11th Circuit in the estate of, in this case, Blount, where the 11th Circuit had said, well, if you have a, if you have a, a company, right, it's got a buy-sell agreement, it's going to buy the shares of the leaving shareholder, right, for a certain value, and it's got life insurance to fund that, that we ignore the life insurance in valuing the company for estate tax purposes because it's exactly offset by the liability. Now, that is a decision of the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. And the catch is that that is only binding in the 11th Circuit. This is in Missouri. It's going to go to the 8th Circuit Court of Appeals. Going to the 8th Circuit, we're going to have an issue here because the Eighth Circuit hasn't mentioned this. The court's position was this. If you are going to sell the company, and let's say we know that Michael's likely to die soon and that life insurance is going to be cashed in, 
a buyer would have paid an additional $3.5 million for the company, for 100% of the company, in addition to the underlying value to buy all of the shares because it knew when Michael died that, in essence, even if it decided to follow this and not cancel the agreement to buy-sell, it would either have a company worth, and the IRS, the IRS and they had agreed on an underlying value, so a company worth just under $7 million, or $3 million in cash and a company worth just under $4 million. In either case, they had the same value. They would have paid, and the you know, and the brothers would have demanded that any purchase of it include the life insurance proceeds that were going to be paid in the near future. The court said it doesn't make sense to exclude those payments in valuing the very thing they're going to be paid for, that that liability doesn't make sense. That liability is just kind of a replacement for the equity. So, yeah, they're saying you really need to value the whole thing. They say we understand that this is at odds with the 11th Circuit, but we disagree. And I love it when judges do respectfully disagree and then tell you why they think the prior opinion is just totally garbage. But they're respectful about it, so they respectfully disagree. Now, what this means, of course, is if you're in the 11th Circuit, if you're in Florida, let's say, uh, this doesn't really impact you, right? The 11th Circuit will still rule this way. It does suggest, though, that the IRS will attack outside of the 11th Circuit on the issue. And at least in this case, it is a single district court in a single state. So don't go overboard. But it does suggest at least one court bought into the IRS's argument. And again, unless we get another circuit, you know, you need to check and see if your circuit has done anything with Blount. Looking in the citators, I haven't really found Blount used that much or the, the real issue here for life insurance used much in any other case. So, you know, you may have an issue going with that. And this is not an unusual structure where the, let's say, the corporation may buy the insurance because the weird thing you notice over the years, I've noticed it too, is that people that own companies don't seem to feel that the company writing a check is not that big a deal, but if they personally have to write a check, it is. So it's a lot easier to get them to do a agreement where the company redeems, which is what the brothers end up doing here effectively, rather than having some sort of cross-purchase arrangement where each one carries life insurance on the other. The problem there, you know, is they just don't like that cross-purchase arrangement because they have to pay the insurance personally. But clearly, if this been a cross-purchase arrangement, it would have worked. Well, at least it would have worked to some extent. We don't know how well it would have, but it certainly kept the life insurance proceeds out of the estate. Or, you know, what would have kept them not part of valuing the company because Thomas would have paid that much for it. Now, maybe it was worth more, and so Thomas got a partially tax-free transfer, but we wouldn't have been looking at the type of adjustment we're looking at here in this case. So... Interesting structure, interesting case. Well, this has been the update for the week of September 27th. Hopefully by later next week, we'll actually know what Congress is going to do. But I have a feeling we probably won't. So keep your eyes on that. It certainly make it fun for me as I'm getting ready to look at the tax update uh, part of the season uh, where I start doing update courses for firms and uh, state societies around the country. By the way, if you're looking to do a course like that, you want it for your firm, you want it for your state society, uh, you know, you can still contact me or contact us, and we'll certainly look at trying to set something up. Uh, at this point, we do so, we have some days. We probably could do it. They run out, you know, so don't, you know, it, it's probably, if it's a single day that can't move, it may get difficult to pull off. But otherwise, you know, be sure to contact us. And, and we'll try to see what we can do or contact your state society. And they can contact Kaplan and set it all up. And we can get that going if you want to. And I'll be doing for various states this year. So I'll be doing sessions around Arizona. I'll be doing one in Idaho. That'll be pretty much an update on new legislation plus developments. So pretty close to a straight update. And we'll just have to see how that all runs. But in any event, remember, you can catch me online on the forums. Or on the Connect sites for Arizona, New Jersey, Minnesota, Illinois, 
You can find me on Idaho's discussion board when something comes up there. Or you can email me, eddollars at currentfortaxdevelopments.com. So we look forward to seeing you next week when we'll talk about whatever happens next week in the area of federal tax developments.